Welcome to E-Commerce Insiders, a journey to success, where we dive deep into the heart of e-commerce, uncovering the secrets behind successful online stores and the entrepreneurs who run them. Hosted by Chris Morano, each episode includes insights, strategies, and inspirational stories designed to guide e-commerce store owners on their journey to building remarkable brands. Whether you're starting up or scaling up, we're here to light the way, sharing the experiences of those who have made their mark. Let's get ready to build your dream brand together. Welcome back to e-commerce insiders. Today I'm thrilled to have Adam Mutchler, the co-founder of archpetfood.com. Adam shares his journey from a family of entrepreneurs to launching a venture-backed eco-friendly pet food brand. Driven by the lack of allergen-friendly options, Adam and his team turned to insect proteins as a sustainable and healthy alternative for pets. Arch Pet Foods is not just about creating better food choices for our furry friends. It's about also making an impact on the environment. Join us as Adam dives into the challenges and triumphs of introducing ArchPetFood.com to the market, their commitment to sustainability, and their vision for the future. This episode is a must listen for anyone who is passionate about e-commerce, innovation, and of course, pets. Let's get into the interview. Hey, Adam, thanks a lot for hopping on e-commerce insiders. Today, we have a guest, Adam, who is the co-founder of Arch Pet Foods, and we're super excited to have you on today. So appreciate you joining us. Thanks for having me, Chris. I'm really excited to, to chop it up and get into it. Awesome. So before we kind of get into the weeds, you know, we were just talking about, give us, give our listeners the overview of who you are and what Arch Pet Foods is who I am or who the business is. <laughs> Let's start with you and then we can lead to uh to Arch Pet Foods. I try not to get too philosophical, uh but it's a it's a soft spot for me. Um yeah, so I I come from a family of entrepreneurs, uh mostly small businesses, lifestyle businesses, uh parents, sibling, aunts, uncles, and so growing up building things is literally that's the blueprint for me you know some some people come from families of teachers or military service or people that were you know worked their entire career at, at a company or an industry uh not my background <laughs> and so i've always i've always dabbled and done things uh like little little projects or little you know for i, I have i have the domain first hustle.co because i'm like maybe i'll do something on that but I've always I've always been building things or creating things, and it wasn't until 2015 that I really launched myself into working for myself and being an entrepreneur. I did executive coaching and leadership consulting, which I still do a little bit of. And then it wasn't until 2021 uh, when I got a text from my now co-founder Gabe, and we had been talking about uh, insect protein for a really long time. Uh, and we were curious about how could it be used as a more sustainable and healthy ingredient in the food, in sort of the food supply chain. And we never clicked on anything until Gabe was fostering dogs and some of the dogs had digestive or stomach issues and talked to his vet. And the vet was like, you need to get them off of conventional proteins, uh, so primarily poultry or, or beef. And in the research he did, he found his way back to this insect conversation that cricket cricket flour and BSFL were both being used in the pet industry as alternative proteins that were hyperallergenic. So there was a text in October 2021 that posited, what about cricket flour for dog food? Um, and, and, and as they say, the rest is history. But, you know, that, that was the spark that led to Arch Pet Food. And Arch Pet Food represents a departure for me in – I've never, I've never, you know, uh, built or grown a venture backed business, but we've, we've raised capital and we're, we're trying to attack an industry as far as our speed and, and what we're trying to do. And, and so it's a whole new, a whole new world, Arch Pet Food. That's crazy. That's really, uh, interesting how one thing always leads to another is a conversation about insect proteins. <laughs> which I have many questions about, but I don't know if we necessarily have the time for that. Um, leading into now a venture-backed, you know, e-commerce direct-to-consumer pet food brand. 
Yeah. Uh, and it, it really actually touches home to me. I have a, we refer to him as our firstborn. We have a, mm. a golden doodle who has just the most terrible digestive issues. And every month the Petco bill is like over $300 because we have to get the hypoallergenic food with this and that to make sure that, you know, our firstborn four-legged furry yeah. son <laughs> does not get sick. So we'll, it was, we'll it was, obviously have to send you, we'll have to send you some treats and hopefully, that'd be awesome. hopefully reduce that bill a little bit. Yeah, it's crazy. But he, what do you do? I mean, it's literally it, yeah. he was he's just part of the family. Um, so super interesting in terms of like. So how did you get from that conversation of insect protein to figuring out how to create this food that is going to be both healthy and and beneficial to the animal? Yeah. So one of the things that I think almost every company or individual or brand can do is you, you look at what's out there, mm -hmm. right? And so when you look at an opportunity, you say, are there, are there enough options? And so the, the first answer is, no, there are not enough allergen-friendly options out there for pets, specifically yep. dogs is our initial focus. Um, and then you, we took a moment and we looked at well, what is out there. And the interesting thing is we had to zoom out. We had to zoom outside the United States. Mm. Uh, in Europe, you have approximately 60 to 70 brands or products that are using insect protein as their primary protein for dog, dog food and treats. Um, you'll find that consumers in Europe are more likely to prioritize sustainability uh, as, a, as a decision maker for, for purchases than in the United States. But the big thing that we saw is that it was being really – that product was being uh, leveraged as a allergen friendly product and that there was potential. Uh, you even look at Canada and they've probably got like 10 to 15 brands out there using insect protein. Um, and so we looked at the U S and there's a couple players. Jiminy's is the incumbent. They've been in, they've been in the, the industry since 2016. And honestly, we look at Anne and we say like, Anne's a trailblazer, even, mm -hmm shows that this is an option, right? Uh, for us. And so that was the first piece. What's in the market? What options do pet parents have? Like ostrich, kangaroo, alligator, not really the most wonderful proteins, right. uh, not very sustainable. You could see them maybe at like a mid market or, or, you know, zoo somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then to your point about cost, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the Options are like hydrolyzed proteins are crazy expensive or That's exactly prescription diets use. are crazy expensive. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And so the, all of these these sort of pieces converge to say, mm -hmm. we think there's an opportunity here. And it's not a, it's not an easy opportunity, but it's there's an opportunity. Right. Um, and so that was the, I would say like that was kind of the market analysis that we started with. Um, and that's, and then I'll take a I'll take a pause for a second. But that that the other element that we don't hammer as heavily on packaging is the sustainability impact is massive. So pets in the United States consume thirty percent of all the meat produced in the United States. Mm -hmm. A lot of that's byproduct or filler, but it's still a subsidization of the meat industry. Uh, and the environmental metrics on cricket flour or BSFL, which is black soldier fly larva. Um, or even, uh, we just, we just launched a product with an invasive fish called Kopi. Mm. Uh, the sustainability metrics on these proteins are bonkers, wow. like save the world bonkers, you know? Wow. Uh, and so we're really excited about that impact as well. So that's awesome. So it, it sounds like then essentially like Arch Pet Food has two different missions, like the sustainability aspect for the planet, and then you have the benefits and the health benefits of the, the animal itself. Yeah. Was there ever a – was that an organic process to get there or was that like a convergence of two ideas that you were like, hey, we can kill two birds with one stone with this brand? Uh, I think it's a handful of things. The, the insect conversation with Gabe started as a how do we, how do we make a more su sustainable food, uh, food supply chain? This mm -hmm. is like – we started talking about this in 2015. Um, so it was really on like the, the human – population needs to find more sustainable food sources. So it started with sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was this wedge of, hey, this is a hyperogenic protein. 
And then I think the greater tension, and you might have you might know this from your marketing experience and work you've done in e-com and folks listening also, you kind of have to pick. Mm-hmm. What's the thing that people are going to make decisions on? And that's a tension that we operate with a lot because we believe that the environmental impact is so important. But the reality is that people are – they're not Googling how do I find – more sustainable products for my dog, right? Right. They're Googling my dog's paws are itchy. My dog's like chewing on their, you know, like chewing on their paw or their skin is dry. They're Googling symptoms. Yep. What do I do? Right. And, and so that's the primary focus, not just of the, our protein, but also we don't include any of the common allergens in our products because I think the, 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 the initial focus and the, and the, and the bigger impact on the day to day is to your point about your firstborn, right? The health and wellness of your dog. Right. And are we, are we able to bring a product that is helping in that world? Uh, that's the primary focus. And then there's this long tail, Hey, it's really good for the environment. Right. So you're not only, yeah, that's amazing. So from the consumer side I and mean, going and looking at things, it's like, okay, the initial problem is solved, but more of the macro problem that many people are aware of is also being solved by this. It's really cool. I mean, a lot of times, you know, when we're when we're creating ads and we're talking about products, when we're doing all this, it's it's the USPs, it's what's the value proposition, like what's the true problem that this solves. Um, and we get a lot of products that don't actually solve a problem. It's more of that impulse buy. And then you have these products that make more of the lasting impact um, in potential for growth opportunities, especially based on, you know, the market research. And I think 2024 in February as we're recording this, there's more of an awareness of what we're all consuming. You know, we see ads all the time is like, do you want your dog to be eating the leftover that we consume in a just kind of gross manner? And it really kind of brings that eye like, Wow. So if I'm interested in grass fed organic beef for my family, and my kids, why am I feeding my dog some chemical processed byproduct of whatever's left over? And it's pretty gross. Yeah. I mean, like I, we try and stay away from the scare tactics too much because it, <laughs> it does get icky, but it is like, you know, there, it, it's why you see like a company like Farmer's Draw, Dog proliferating, right? Like this fresh food movement. And I think like, I think if we look at the pet industry, I would say primary objective, get pets healthier food. Right. Right. The more transparency, healthier food. And for pets that have allergens, make sure that they have options that are good for them. That would be like the number one priority. Um, And then there is an, there's an interesting challenge with like the fresh food, which I think again is healthier and better for pets, but it does introduce I think increased sustainable sustainability concerns, right? Like refrigeration, freezing, transportation yep. of refrigerated goods, cost, and cost, and also using a protein, using protein parts of protein that would typically be used uh, in for human consumption, mm-hmm. and so there's a sort of net increase in the right. need for a poultry or a, a beef or, um, yeah, it's a Make it's sure a that- in two years. The the amount that I have learned about the pet industry mm-hmm. is mind. I can imagine. I can yeah. imagine. If you are looking for a community of fellow e-commerce store owners who you can bounce ideas off of and learn from and answer questions and just be around like-minded people, join our private Facebook group, e-commerce insiders where you'll be able to learn from fellow store owners and also be able to provide insights. Join our private Facebook group. There's a link in the show notes below, or just go on Facebook and search e-commerce insiders. It is a private group. So you will have to answer three very easy questions. Also, if you have any intention of selling anything, this group is not for you. Our goal is to provide as much value as possible to the community, not sell anything. Look forward to seeing you there. So let me ask you a question. With all of the, the proteins and the insights and kind of all the ingredients and what you guys are developing these products with, do either of you have like that science background or were you able to source 
the information necessary to put together the product that you guys are looking to, you know, launch and help these animals with? Uh, I will start by saying we don't have the science background. Perfect. Uh, I will follow up closely with, um, I, I believe that my co-founder and I have a really, really good idea of what we're good at and a really, mm -hmm. really, really strong idea, maybe even stronger idea of what we're not good at. Mm. And I, I think our strength particularly has been finding unbelievably qualified people to support us in manifesting this vision, right? And so it started, my co-founder is getting his MBA at University of Chicago at Booth, and it started with getting a collection of Booth MBAs to support us in sort of the modeling of the, the, the financial modeling and sort of the business model, right? And saying, hey, Kim, do we have something to stand on? And, and mm -hmm. we got that, which was great. And then for our first four products, finding people that have been formulating pet food products, you know, treats and food for 20 years and working with formulationists for our first, first couple products. And then it, even finding our co-manufacturers who have their own technical experience as well as testing and quality uh, requirements. Um, and so, and then we've been surrounding ourselves with a, a group of advisors that have infinitely more experience in the pet industry than we do. And, uh, and so f it's a long answer, but the, the, the answer is we're, we're not experts in this space. We didn't come from pet, but I think we put a high priority on how do we find folks that have all the things we don't have and can really help us, including our brand, by the way, always, always give a shout out to Noel. The number one comment we get from retailers uh, and distributors is your packaging is unbelievable. Yep. Uh, it doesn't look like other things that we've seen and it really, there's something about it. And, you know, so we, we were fortunate through one of our investors to get introduced to, you know, Noel, who's helped us with our branding and uh, all these pieces matter. Yep. Right. Um, and, and, and being able to put that puzzle together, uh, has been a, has been a major effort over the last two years. Yeah. It, it couldn't be more accurate. We, um, at my company, it's the same thing. It's, it's the vision is what drives you, but then the pieces have to be what keep it going. It's like the fuel to the tank. Um, and, and I completely agree. You know, we get leads all the time. We get people who want to be on the podcast all the time. And the first thing we do is we go to the website. Well, what is this brand? You know, what is it? And really taking a look was one of the, it's really one of the qualifiers, you know, to understand like the vision behind the business is representative of the website, the branding. You know, if it was a clear bag with a sticker on it, you're like, okay, hey, we're still in the really in entry level phase of this brand, you know, like figure some more things out. But when we went on to archpetfood.com for all our listeners, that's where you can check out Adam. We <laughs> will leave all the notes in the descriptions. Um, but there was a, a phenomenal effort in differentiating this brand, which more looks like one of the high-end organic snacks on the direct-to-consumer space that we're seeing these days. And then quick dive down, you're saying, okay, this is actually what's going on with this business. These are the ingredients. These are how they're helping. This is, once again, the problem that's solved. You guys have done a phenomenal job with uh, with integrating, you know, from a marketing standpoint, the branding is just, it really is awesome. I mean, snap, snaps for Noel all day long. <laughs> yeah. Well done, Noel. <laughs> yeah. So going into, you know, um, as you guys are evolving in this business and you've identified the ingredients, who's putting it together, what has been the learning curve in terms of bringing these products to market? And like, I, th I just had like a thousand thoughts that came to my mind. So, I mean, I, I think it'd be interesting to talk about in this situation, like for this show and this conversation, right? Ecom Insider um, journey to success. We're very much in the, in the middle to early stages of the journey to success. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there are elements that we've crushed like brand. I feel like we've crushed and being able to integrate into an industry quickly, we've crushed. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the, one of the interesting challenges is traction, right? Like yep. 
who's like, where are you experiencing traction? And so the learning curve, I would say is the pet, we knew this, but we're learning it now intimately. And like from the work that we're doing, pet is insanely competitive. There yep. are, there is so much money being spent by people with so much more money than we have to either maintain their position in the market or gain position in the market. And I think when you're thinking about a product and an industry that you are interested in, continuing to educate yourself on what is the, what is the competition like at a technical level? So we'll talk, let's talk a little e-com for a second, right? The, the cost of acquiring customers on social and, you know, on Amazon, online, in pet, especially treats, which are the first four products we had, we have six treats now, um, it's insanely competitive. We, we've worked with a lot of different contractors and people who've worked in this, you know, on various platforms. And it's the thing that almost always comes up. They're like, yeah, I haven't worked with a pet brand before, but like we crush it with these other brands. Mm -hmm. Um, they'll start running some tests and they're like, I've never seen CPCs or like ad, ad spend like this. Uh, And so, you know, I think that that's one, that's, that's part of like the the humbling aspect of of, of getting things going. Our, we're built for omni channel, uh, mm-hmm. an omni channel strategy, and so we actually you'll find us in retail stores in Chicago. That's our biggest market because that's where the company is based. You'll find us in a, in in a smattering of other stores across the country as we sort of work into into our the independent pet retail channel, which I think is also mm-hmm. very unique for pet, right? Like. There are like in the Midwest, our dist- one of our distributors is in the Midwest, and they have a, over a thousand independent pet retail stores in their network. Right, yep. I was at one yesterday. Door. I yeah. was literally at an independent small little local shop down here in South Florida to get a very specific bone for my dog because my wife wanted to give him a Valentine's Day bone. <laughs> right, but it's an interesting category because when you think about it, you know there there aren't necessarily. Um, th- there's not that much proliferation of maybe other channels. So like I was talking to someone who, who does, uh, has kid toys and there are toy stores. Don't get me wrong. Um, but there's not the same volume of toy right. stores as there are independent pet retail. And so when we, we, when we started, we were like, we think we're going to be heavier online and, but we'll also try to get into stores. Uh, and about halfway through last year, which was really our first year with product 2023, um, we realized that we need to focus a lot more on the independent pet retail channel for two reasons. One, and this might not be helpful for e-com folks, it's free 99 to knock on doors and talk to stores. Sure. <laughs> yep. Um, and, and, and the other is you have to have, either you have to have uh, incredible social savvy or virality, like you go viral, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or you have to have a reasonable amount of capital to really attack online. And right. we we didn't have those three things. So we, we, we're building we're building online out, but there has been this interesting focus on the independent pet retail. And so literally moving product has been this really, it's like the way I describe it, if you've ever been on a train, and it's at, at a station, especially like an Amtrak or a big train, not necessarily a metro. When it leaves the station for the first time, you can feel like you can feel the jolt of each car starting to move mm-hmm. until all the cars are moving. So every time it's like a little moment where it's like clunk, clunk, and then your yep. car is moving and then there's a pause and then it's, it happens again. And it feels like that's where we are, right? The train is just getting to move after two years of brand development, product development, Get, testing out different channels. And so I think I got away from your initial question, but you know, that's been sort of the biggest learning is getting the momentum, getting, getting, going. getting this movement. Yeah. Yep. And then you start to have the compounding effect. Um, it's really interesting that you bring up like the customer acquisition costs. This is basically the main conversation for me now as like a, an e-com agency owner with our clients, separate from like just the media buying conversation is the cost per new customer acquisition. And certain clients have a one-time 
you know, maybe someone buys again 18 months later. Um, you know, so we have to look at the margins. What are the variable costs associated with delivering a single SKU to a customer? What is the lifetime value of that? What are those OPEX that you have to have to account for sustaining your business and really understanding those and then being able to, and, and for anyone listening, but Adam, I think this is very pertinent to your business is that lifetime value for you is way better than, you know, an apparel brand that has hats or t-shirts that someone might buy one or two. Personally, like I have, I have an alliance to the t-shirt company where these same shirts every single day, I spend a thousand dollars with them a year probably. And like, I'm the <laughs> ideal customer, but for most brands, who, who you rocking, who you rocking built, built basics. Yeah. They, they no, killed no it. affiliate links at all, but yeah, they're, they killed they're it. the best. It's like everyone I I'm a, I'm just going to throw out there. I'm a Buck Mason guy. Okay. Um, and they, they, they do, they got, you know, these made in America t-shirts, but Mostly because I'm not that athletic. They're just cotton. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> yeah, I need like, the, you know, the long flowing, like kind of still stylish t-shirt. Actually, this is absurd. I, I'm, I'm Buck Mason all the way across. Also, no I affiliate love it. links. Just love things to last. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what it is, is you find something that you really like. And I think that goes to like, what is the story, you know, for you guys, if those treats are phenomenal, if my dog is no longer biting his paws off his pads, you know, or his pads off his paws, we're going to keep buying that, right? So then you're able to use metrics to establish that lifetime value. Problem is, to your point, the initial capital needed to get those new customers to then even be able to figure out what those metrics are is challenging these days, you know, these days. You know, it's a really, it's a really, really good point. And I, and I point, I, I highlight this all the time, I will say, um, I feel incredibly fortunate to have started with a team of booth MBAs, including my mm-hmm. co-founder Gabe, right? Yeah. There, there was, a, there's a level of research and prep and sort of like quantitative and qualitative analytics that went into what is this going to look like, right? Operationally. Yep. And w- how does this need to be built? And how do, what do we need to consider? And so I'm going to wager that almost everyone, if, if not everyone, most aren't starting a business in that environment. And right. so the second thing that just as a comment and maybe a, a you know, piece of a little bit of insight, you, you can do research. You can do a lot of research. Like you can Google a lot, a lot, a lot of things or chat GPT, I guess, mm-hmm. to not age myself too much, right? <laughs> that you can find like LTV is, is huge. Right. So LTV and pet in dog food, because dog food is actually our, our primary goal when we're launching our, our dog food in the next several months. We're really excited. And it's probably why it's so competitive, but the LTV on, on dog food is pretty phenomenal. Yep. Because to your point, unlike something that you might buy once every 18 months, dog food gets purchased minimum monthly. Right. Um, and typically for the life of a dog, or at least the like the gener- like the life stage of a dog. So while they're a puppy, a couple right. years, adults, right? And then yeah. like when they're aging. And and so I think probably one of the reasons why it's so competitive is because people are really fighting for like that 900, 1200 LTV, right? Yeah. Like, which is not, you know, not, not unusual. Um, and I think the more prep you can do, because there is a lot of data, uh, the the more strategic you can be in in ad spend. Like we've never put a ton of money in ads because we know how competitive it is, and so we've mm-hmm. always done really really small tests because we know. It, and right, what are that, like just for the listeners, depending on where they are in business right now, like what is that small test um, budget that you guys have? I mean, like thirty dollars a day sometimes. Yeah. To literally see like what type of interaction we get, what type of click through we get. Right. Um, people that we've worked with get kind of frustrated sometimes. So like the more money you put in, the faster everything learns, which we totally get truly. Yep. Right. Um, but we're also trying to be really capital efficient. Like we've raised capital from other folks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we want to be, we want to be really thoughtful about that and strategic. And for uh, most people who start businesses, they don't fundraise. And so if you do something as risky as cash out, a nest egg or something 
yep. you want to be really thoughtful because what's going to happen is, and I'm sure it's not Chris, uh, but there are going to be people that tell you, you need to spend X amount of money in advertising and they're going to give you some really generic formula. Um, and it's not generic. It's like highly specific, highly tailored yep. to your brand, your product, your audience, the, the market that you're in, the time that you're doing it. And so I, I, I would just say, depending on, you know, for any, any, any capital constraint or any capital reality, you want to be really strategic mm -hmm. because also that money can disappear quickly. And for most people, including ourselves, it doesn't necessarily come back unless you've got revenue. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, it's definitely one of those weird things. I mean, we get the question all the time, how much money do I spend? And you know, and, and the truth is like minimum is like a $5,000. And that's a test budget that you are willing to lose based on like, what is the creative work? What's the landing pages? I mean, advertising online is a test until you figure it out. You right. know, luckily there are people who figure it out. I mean, we have clients make millions of dollars, I'm sure. And there's countless e-com D to C brands that are making millions of dollars, but you have to have that capital first. So I think, you know, I respect the fact that with a capital invested business that you guys are being respectful of their money as well, as if it was yours. Uh, because I know with our, the thousands of dollars we spend a month in advertising, you're like, well, how many leads are, you know, and it's, it has to be looked at that way. And I think hopefully, yeah. you know, as, as marketers, yeah. like you, there needs to be a respect. I think that's where just small business to small business is really important. Like you don't want to take money off of someone's table that they're eating with, you know? Yeah. And, and so I, I commend you guys for also looking at other alternatives to bootstrap kind of quote unquote, even with some capital behind you to figure out how can we get those sales coming through at least to start driving revenue to then figure, figure out the metrics later. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, for me, it's always about solving a series of problems yep. and in entrepreneurship, whether you're an individual small business or just like a solopreneur, all the, all the titles, right. Success for me is really about being able to solve a series of problems in a sequence. And I had a conversation with someone and they're like, well, what, like at the end of the, like at the end of, let's say two, three, four, five years, if, if you didn't smash it, like if the business closes, right. Um, will you look back and be like, that wasn't realistic. Like it was too competitive or fill in the blank. Right. And, you know, I thought about the question for a moment, and, but my response was, I don't think I'll ever look back and say it wasn't realistic. I think I would look back and say, I wasn't able to solve or my team wasn't able to solve, you know, my co-founder and I weren't able to solve the sequence of problems that we were presented in the order that they were presented in the way that they needed to be solved. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone else would have, in which case it wasn't unrealistic. Or maybe, maybe if we had sequenced them differently, they would have been, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I think same with advertising, you know, and, and, and spending, you know, putting ad spend online, there's an element of, being prudent and strategic, but also you're constantly solving problems, yep. right? So like Amazon, <laughs> I, I, at the, in fall last year, I, we were like, let's, we need to be on Amazon. We, we got everything on Amazon the, in the summer last year. And in fall, we were like, we should run some Amazon ads. And so I just literally took all of the Amazon recommendations mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, let's spend a thousand dollars. Um, and we How'd spent, it work? A, uh, I think, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I asked like because literally just did a LinkedIn post yesterday or the day before about like the Google ads recommendations when they call you and they're like, hey, you should do X, Y, and Z. And yeah. we've tested it and they're the worst things yeah. ever. Like, so I, I was just bored. Yeah, so it worked like this. The row ads was like, the row ads was like 0. 0.15 or something. Yeah. It was yeah. Like, so I, like, I was like, okay, well, that doesn't work. Right. Um, And then we found someone who was like, applied strategies that they had used before and they did it for like three days mm -hmm. and didn't spend any, they spent like 60 bucks and they were mm -hmm. like, this isn't the way everything is set up here. Isn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so coming into the new year, we've done a reset. We're running again, very small tests. I think in the last this week, this is the first week of spending money on Amazon. Again, we've spent, I'm, I swear six, 30, $60 on Amazon. In ads, we have a handful of sales through the ads. We have we have organic sales also, right? We mm -hmm. have a handful of sales through the ad spend, and our 
the ROAS on ads that are getting clicks are above a two, which is not smashing it, but right. you're bringing in not money. losing money. <laughs> right. Positive exactly. cash flow. And so, right, exactly. And so like, I'm, I'm a, I'm a pretty transparent person, uh, which is why I, I like sharing this. But I think the bigger piece here is that like, if you don't know what you're doing in, in certain categories, in certain domains, which is true for everyone, right? Part of it is finding people that do know what they're doing, which again, I think is some of the work that you do, Chris. Um, I think the other part is you have to find people that are going to, that that, wanna, that will work with you in a way that aligns with whatever your strategy is or whatever your approach yep. is as well, right? And so it's been really interesting finding those partners that are like, yeah, let's make, let's do these small tests. Let's, let's tweak, let's, let's tool, right? Yep. Um, and get to that. And, and I, does, I don't know your, your audio, excuse me, your audience breakdown, but like we were using terms like LTV, lifetime value or ROAS, right? Return on advertising, you know, and things like that, like ad spend, excuse me. Like, um, yep. I think there, there, there are all sorts of little acronyms that if you don't know them, most people probably don't. So Google it. I'm learning them literally every week. <laughs> My intention would be if they – those acronyms are super important to know. Um, understanding those numbers are going to be like the lifeblood of any business uh, in the e world. It's interesting, the Amazon test, and, and are you guys familiar with like what your break-even ROAS is and understanding the variable costs associated with product fulfillment? you know, and all of that to, to, ju- to understand that two X. One of the things I think a lot of people inherently believe is like, oh my God, two and a half, every dollar I spend, I'm getting two fifty back or $3 back. Like this is a time to pump, like let's scale to the moon, you know? But if you don't have shipping costs, credit card fees, uh, Amazon fees, fulfillment costs, pick and pack, all of these associated with that initial product cost, added into it, you might actually need like a 4.5 ROAS just to break even. And and it's kind of a scary thing for e I'm going through it with, with somebody right now just doing some coaching in that their 48% gross margin is not their actual margin when you add in the 3%, 2.99% Shopify payment processing fee, the shipping cost that they incur. So now there's another $5 tacked onto it. And their ROAS, what they thought was a 1.48 is actually a 2.95. And on social for this specific product type is really challenging to get because there is no value proposition. You know, like we were talking about at the beginning with Arch Pet Food, you guys have that like emotional tie to the products you're selling, the benefits associated with it. Fortunately, this product doesn't. And so to get a three on Facebook to break even and after spending $5,000 to make five, like it just, the numbers don't add up. And I think a lot of times that needs to be a thought in the beginning of business instead of two, three, four years in. You're like, man, I'm still just trying to figure out how to keep my head above water. And it's because the numbers, the financial side of it isn't being included. Everyone sees these videos and they're like, oh, drop ship this, sell this, this is trending. But if you're trying to grow a brand in a business, I look at it as like that finance side of it has to be the first conversation um, after kind of the market analysis. Yeah, I would like to just refer back to all of the wonderful folks that started helped us start i'm honestly like you know we have a couple folks that are still with us supporting along the way like steve and sabrina um you know who are or got their mba at booth and you know i think it's one of those things it it's like a series of this is true for everything in life it's like a series of really small decisions throughout the day Mm -hmm. week and year uh and it's a series of small choices that we make that will determine whether we have no success, some success, immense success. Right. And, and there are certain things and we've heard this from investors, right? They're like, get your margins right early. It's hard to re-engineer margins. Right. Uh, And again, it depends on what type of business you're, 
you're, you know, you're trying to build. Like if we're trying to build a business that, you know, maybe one day we find ourselves doing 40, 50, a hundred million dollars in revenue in the pet space, we have to have a really, really strong foundation on the model, yeah. on the pricing. We have to have visibility and we do have visibility into like, you know, what, where do our costs start to decrease? Like, you know, yeah. like where are price breaks in manufacturing and with certain supply, you know, suppliers and things like that. Um, so we know that with certain volumes, our cogs are going to decrease, right? Yeah. Uh, other costs will increase, but we, we, we know, we do know that. Um, and I, I really, you know, understanding the market, understanding what problem you're solving. And I'll be frank. I don't, I have a, I, I have like a little pet peeve. Like don't, don't put a product in the market if it's not solving a problem, like a legit problem. Cause yeah. there's plenty of, there's plenty of options out there. That's my opinion. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the numbers, I'm really the first person to tell you that that is not my strong suit. So if it's not, if you're listening and it's not your strong suit, don't feel overwhelmed or bad about it. Like, just find someone who does know it right? and who can help you. Even if it's a friend who can get you the basic, like take a look at something and give you the basic f- framework of, hey, this is what you should be looking at. And if you have, if you don't have someone you can talk to or you can't afford to pay someone, then this is the, in coaching and leadership work, we talk about like learning edges. This is a learning edge and challenge yourself to do a little bit of research. Yeah. Uh, it, it will dramatically increase your chances of at least making good progress, if not, you know, like the success that you're working towards. For 100%. And there's so many good, you have to dive a little deeper on YouTube, but there are some really great podcasts and videos where it really breaks down like the financial side of e com. I'm actually trying to steer some of my content in that direction to just help more businesses because we talk to so many that are like, you know, you just don't have it here if you increase here, but will the market allow for a price increase? Um, so definitely do the research. It is so important. I mean, I think all of us, I'm sure you've had times where you get lost in the passion behind the project. Instead of taking that step back and looking at the business side of the project. And and I highly recommend, especially people kind of in that startup phase, you know, sub a million to really dive deep into those numbers. And I think, um, go ahead. Just, just one other thing, because we're talking about like people that can help. Like my co-founder and I, I think we have a good amount of similarities, but also we have a lot of differences stylistically, mm-hmm. how we communicate, how we think about things, how we problem solve. And I would say if you have someone you, you can build something with, I think that's great. Uh, it increases sort of your ability to solve problems, especially when you might not have a ton of resources in the beginning. And again, if you don't, like a, a lot of the advisors that we found are people that we networked into or went on LinkedIn and literally was like, you've been doing this thing for a really long time. Would you be willing to talk to us about what we're doing? Um, and we found some really great folks. So whether it's Instagram or TikTok or I, I do a lot of business stuff. So LinkedIn is a little bit more prevalent for me. It, you, you will find people that will legitimately be helpful and yep. my, in one conversation could save you a lot of headaches, right? And like, money. yeah, I'll, I'll just make one comment on packaging early, early in our packaging de- design, uh, a gentleman named Paul, he works for a insect manufacturer named called Protex in, uh, in Europe. He, it may be the biggest connoisseur of packaging that I know. And early on, he was like, if your value props aren't in the middle of your package, mm-hmm they'll get cut off on the shelf by whatever retailers put on their shelf. Shelf talkers, if there's if there's like tags there or on the top, if they're hanging something from the top. And I swear to you, I would have never known that. I wouldn't have thought about it. Would never cross my mind, you know? And then he talked about the bottom of the dog food package is super important because they're going to lay them flat. So think about what it looks like on the bottom or the side because sometimes they're laid flat and stacked. Uh-oh. And it's like, okay, we had no idea. And we, we could have seen it maybe ourselves, but to have him really highlight that as a priority, it's like, cling. Wow. Okay. Right. And so it's just like, and that like, you have to develop relationships and cultivate relationships, but there are going to be p- people out there that can save you a lot of time and energy and headaches and, and things like that. That's a really interesting perspective in terms of the, the packaging. And oh, I mean, I, like- I, 
that is like, <laughs> yeah, it's like the light bulb went off. Like, yeah, obviously, Chris, that, you know, you pick up the 80 pound bag every month and I see yeah. the bottom of the bag. Yeah. That is so insane. That's awesome. Yeah. Super interesting because, you know, I think a lot of times in the D2C spaces, it's very individualized, right? There's no face behind a brand. Um, sometimes there are, obviously, yeah. but a lot of times it's the brand. And, and, and so then bringing that personal touch to build those relationships, really good insights. I think a lot of people miss nowadays where we're just all online. You know, and it's you're selling a picture of a product or you're selling a video of a product of someone else using the product. And, <laughs> and there's no more of that personal connection. So great recommendation. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Awesome. So as we're wrapping up the show, um, you had mentioned like that 40, 50, $100 million brand. Like what is it? Where do you guys see Arch Pet Food going? What are your like short term, long term goals with this uh, this business? Uh, I mean, it really started with this idea that pets deserve better food options. There are some good ones out there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to dog the whole market, right? But there need to be better ones. And so, you know, there's about 9 million dogs in the United States that have some sort of food sensitivity and, you know, if we can help them out and their pet parents make better decisions or have, you know maybe more nutritious and sustainable options. I think that like at the core, it's that passion, that vision that you talked about. Um, you know, I think from a traction standpoint, like that first thousand stores is huge for us. Uh, I think in the next couple of months, really, honestly, I think we might be early for some of your e-com brands that you talk to, but like tooling that online strategy, right. So mm -hmm. that it's, so that it's really geared towards, success and, and, and growth. Um, and, and we're launching our, we're launching our dog food in, in the spring. And so this is our hero product. It's the thing that will make the diff really big difference. Treats are great. Um, but they're treats, right? right? Just like chips or pretzels or whatever. Uh, and so the food product is the, is the product that we've been working to for by now, then two and a, two and almost two and a half years. And so I think this year, it's really seeing that product in market and and just hearing about the impact that it has for dogs and pet parents. That's what we're focused on. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah. Well, where can everybody find you? Where can they check you out, um, both either on a personal side of it or for Arch Pet Food, so that when this food does come out, they can be right there to check yeah. out? Absolutely. I'm archpetfood.com, A-R-C-H-P-E-T-F-O-O-D.com at arch pet food everywhere um if you are particularly interested in what i say or how i talk about things uh i'm not going to spell my name but it's adam mutchler and you can find it in the notes or in the yep. title of this episode and they're not a lot of me so i'm pretty easy to find and and this is this is a this is an honest offer um i'm happy to chat with folks that are trying to figure stuff out that you know, want to learn about things or get connected with folks. Um, I'm a really big believer. You mentioned relationships, Chris, and I'm a really big believer in, in relationships. You just never know where they're going to go. Yep. And so I appreciate this as well. I mean, thank you for having me on the show. And it's great talking about things out loud and thinking things through out loud, a little on the hot mic moments, but you know, yeah, it's good to be here. So I appreciate you, Chris. Yeah, of course. My, my whole thing is, you know, YouTube channel. We I basically teach everything that I know how to do. This is like we help teach other people and it's like as much value as possible. I, I truly believe in like value brings value, you know, and I think that's to your point. Like uh, there's a symbiotic relationship in helping others and in, in receiving. So I appreciate you taking the time out. I know you're a busy man. You have a growing family. And so I really value, you know, this time spent together. And I think it was just an awesome conversation. And I wish you guys the absolute best. Thank you, Chris. And we'll see you guys in the next episode.